Thank you, teenagers, for ministering to us tonight. You did a fantastic job and uh, certainly ministered to my heart, as I'm sure it did each one here. Grab your Bibles. Join me in Deuteronomy, or uh, yes, Deuteronomy. I almost said the wrong book. Deuteronomy chapter number six. Deuteronomy chapter number six. The title of tonight's message is Who Are You Following? I'll readily admit right off the bat I've geared this mostly or uh, not mostly, maybe specifically to teenagers, though it will have application for all ages and adults, mom and dads especially too, and young people, children, I'd encourage you to uh, listen up. And uh, teenagers, something tonight I want to share from my heart. The Lord has laid this message on my heart for uh, several months now. And, uh, and, and things that I have dealt with, things that I have seen and witnessed as pastor of Fostoria Baptist Church, and yet even much uh, beyond that in my years as a youth youth pastor and so forth and things I've seen and I just want to share my heart with you tonight and teenagers parents alike I, I just want to share with you and challenge you all at the same time and and uh, I'm thankful for our great group uh, of teenagers I'm grateful for uh, their desire to serve the Lord as they did tonight I really am I'm grateful for that and so just want to encourage you tonight so the question is this and young people all have candy at the end I'll make sure we get that bucket in fact uh, Carter if you wouldn't mind at the end of the service would you go grab that and bring that up here that'd be great and uh, so we'll have that up here. So children, uh, if you pay attention, listen up. Uh, we might have a question tonight, very simple for you. And so you can have a piece of candy or a treat, pencils, stickers, all that good stuff. We ask this question, who are you following? When I ask it, young person, uh, what we're asking is this. Who do you listen to? Who, who do you pay attention to? Who is it that you're giving your focus and attention to? We, we know, we've said it often, that there is much in the world around us that is vying for our attention and our focus. And really, for us to look at, um, when Jesus Christ called his disciples, you know this well. When Jesus Christ called his disciples, he said what? Follow me. Now, I want you to notice he didn't say follow the hypocrite, follow the one who uh, it, it has a different God, follow the one who has one foot in the world and one foot uh, following uh, God and all that he has said. That's not what he said. He said, follow me. Jesus Christ, as we sing about tonight, I, I want to be like him. That's, that is the ultimate goal. That is who we are to follow he didn't say follow somebody like the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, religious leaders of the day who had their own opinions about things and thoughts and they put those opinions on the same level of God as God's word. He didn't say follow them. He said, follow me. Now, look around you. Okay? Jesus Christ isn't here. We get that. And uh, yet, certainly we have him within the word today. And, and that's good, necessary, and that's wonderful. But you know what I'm thankful for? God in heaven said, young person, that each one of us as believers, and I think especially teenagers and children, you need additional examples and you need additional guides, might we put it, uh, for you to look at and follow after. It's interesting as we think about what happened between Jesus Christ and the disciples. You realize that Jesus Christ said, follow me. And as he did for three, three and a half years, the disciples followed Christ. They learned how to pray. They, they learned how to love people. They, they learned how to minister to people. They learned how to be kind and attitude and things. They knew, they learned how to stand up for what is right and stand up against what is wrong. They followed Jesus Christ, these disciples, and they learned of him. They watched him as he interacted with masses and multitudes. They watched him as he interacted with a lowly, despised leper. They watched and learned. They followed him, and, and they kind of, in a mental sense, they took notes. Oh, we need to act like that. That's what God wants. That's how he wants my attitude and my words to be. They, they followed that. They paid attention. They, they marked him, if we might put it as such. The fact is, God has now given you and I such examples, such guides. God's Word, number one. The Holy Spirit, number two, which is the perfect complement to the Word of God. But young people, can I encourage you? Deuteronomy chapter 6 makes this abundantly clear. God has privileged you with putting examples in your home. Your mom and dad ought to be at the top of the list, right after God, His Word, and the Holy Spirit, of who you follow. And I'm not just talking about on Facebook. 
I'm talking about who you mark, who you watch. You say, okay, mom, dad, I'm going to watch you. How, how does your love for God play out? How do you live it out in your attitudes and your actions and so forth? Uh, how do you, I, I want to follow you because here's my problem tonight. Don't miss it. Young person, college age, teenager, young person. Listen, in our world today, there are way too many young people who want to follow their peers instead of their parents. It ought not so to be. That is not God's plan. Now, it is great and good to have Christian friends who are wanting to do right. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But my friend, can I tell you, number one, God wants you to follow your parents. When it comes to humans in your life who God has given as an example, as, as those who you can follow in their footsteps, parents are at the top of the list. In Deuteronomy chapter number 6, look at verse number 1 with me, if you will. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son. Uh, notice it, and thy son's son. All the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Okay? So what do we find in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 3? The simple reality is that this is what God has called Israel to do in the land in which he has placed them. Now there are principles that correlate to this same fact. That where you are, where God has placed you, he has called you to do similar things. So where God has placed you, in that place, he wants you to do the same thing. Now it, it starts out with parents. So mom and dad, listen up. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 6 is the quintessential passage for Old Testament parenthood. Instructing parents has how you uh, pass that on. Here's how you take your son and your son's son and you pass on the knowledge of God and the principles, the commandments, the statutes that God has given. Okay? Notice the emphasis to the adults here. We won't delve into it too deeply, but notice it. Parents and grandparents were first to what? Learn them. It says be taught. Learn them. And then to what? Do them. Do them. It goes on. Notice it, if you will, with me. Uh, he says, verse number uh, one, it repeats it, do them. Verse number two, uh, keep all his statutes and commandments. And so that then is the expression, or if we might describe it, that is the action that erupts from a heart of love and reverence and fear. Then verse number three, he has this. Hear it. And observe to do it. In other words, make it your checklist. Now listen, hey, some of us men, I know for me, listen, when, when Erica sends me to the store or asks me to pick up some of the store, I have learned, the closer I get to 50, um, that I need to make a list. Because I forget, okay? And, uh, and, and when that list starts getting from 1 to 2 to 5 to 10 to 15 items, I'm in trouble. So, you know what I do? I make a list on my phone or something like that. Or I'm like, she says, okay, can you pick up this? Can I? I'm like, just text it to me. Just text it, man. I can at least read the text. And so I'm walking through the store, and I'm like, okay, got to grab this, you know. And so I pick it up. You know what that is? That's observing to do. That's what God said. Now listen to me. Hey, Christian, adult, mom and dad, you and I are called to take God's commands and statutes, and we are called to observe to do. We take them with us everywhere we go. Why? Because thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I, I observe to do it. I take it. Okay, this is how I ought to act in this situation. This is how I ought to respond, respond in that, uh, that situation. This is how I'm supposed to live and do it. Observe to do. So we take it. We observe to do it. And the promise result, I love this. Did you catch it? Man, our God is so gracious. He starts out and he says, listen, man, you want to do this? Your life will be prolonged. It will be well with thee. You will mightily increase. And we love this description of the new land. In the land that flows with milk and honey. I mean, I'd want it to flow with Dr. Pepper and Funyuns. But anyway, it's milk and honey, okay? It's milk and honey. And, and this is great. This is gonna be a, uh, you're going to be blessed. Now, for you and I, that necessarily isn't the goal that's promised. 
for you and I, could I put it this way, our promised result when we live like this is the abundant, joyful, peaceful life in which all things work together for our good. See, that's the New Testament promise to you and I as New Testament believers. God said, I want you to have the abundant life, that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Teenager, listen to me. God wants you to have an abundant life. God wants you to have joy, a joyful life. I am so sick and tired of seeing teenagers walk around with no joy. Hey, listen, you ought, you ought to have joy. You know the King of kings and Lord of lords. You know what happens when you die because you trusted Jesus Christ. You know who holds the future, and your God will not do you wrong. So have joy. Be excited about life. Because, my friend, when you follow God, you listen and obey his statutes and commands. Oh, my friend, he's going to bring it about for your good. He wants you to have an abundant, joyful, peaceful life in which all things work together for our good. And we love that verse. For we know, Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that are called according to the purpose, or excuse me, to them that love God and who are the called according to his purpose. Now look, look up this way, teenager especially. Because there's been a time in my life where a teenager looked me in the face and, and they were choosing to do wrong. They were not living for God. They were not in the Bible. And they looked at me and they said, hey, Pastor Henry, I, I, I'm still clinging to Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Listen to me. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 has two qualifiers. Now, I am thankful for the promise that says, we know that all things work together for good. Our good, God's glory. That is a biblical principle. But there are two qualifiers here. The first is this, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Don't get caught up in the verbiage. It simply means this, you are his, you belong to him. You're a child of God. You put your faith and trust in him. You've trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're part of the family of God. And so you are the called according to his purpose. Now listen, secondly, did you catch it? It's actually the first one listed, but I put it second. All things work together for good to them that love God. Love God. Now listen, this is not just a flippant, just say the words kind of love. This isn't just you and me saying, oh yeah, I love God. Of course I love God. No, 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 no. That, that's not the love described here, nor is it the love that Christ describes time and time again throughout the scriptures that God describes. This is the kind of love that he brings up in this passage before us. See, if I want all things to work together for my good and God's glory in my life, I've got to make sure, number one, I'm saved. Number two, you know what else I need to make sure? That I love God. And that love has some description. Not just a flippant love, not just a, a passing love, not just an infatuation, not just a crush on God. It is a real love for God. How is it described in our passage? Well, look with me, verse number four and verse number five. He goes on to describe that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul. And with all thy might. Now we see this repeated time and time again throughout the scriptures. Uh, Christ himself repeats it in the New Testament, explaining the two great laws, commandments. We see this first description, love the Lord with all thine heart. What does that mean? It really means this. My love for God moves me to make him alone the great determiner in my life. Okay? It moves me along. My love, my love for God constraineth me to make him the great determiner. What do I mean by the great determiner? Well, it's that love for him. I allow him. It, it helps to formulate my desires and my delights. It informs my decisions. God and his word and my love for him. It forms the basis for him sitting at the controls of life. One of the probably most fearful but exciting times for a parent is when they're training their teenager to drive. Here's the keys. Let's have a moment of prayer. Take them, start it up, let's go. That's letting them sit at the controls. Can I tell you, there is nothing, nothing, nothing fearful about letting Jesus Christ sit at the controls of your life. Nothing. 
And if you love him this way, you love him with all your heart, you say, okay, God, college, you tell me. Mary, you tell me who I'm going to marry. Father, you tell me what you want me to do with my life. I'm trusting you. You sit at the controls because I love you with all my heart. You just tell me, you are my Lord, my master, you are my God, I'll follow you wherever. That's the love that he speaks of. You want all things to work together for your good? Love him with all your heart. Love him where it informs your delights. I love what verse 4 says. For the Lord your God is what? One Lord. Nothing else determines your delights and your desires. Nothing else determines the decision and informs it. God alone. Then, as if that wasn't enough, you know the other description of this love? It's a love that we love the Lord with all of our soul. It really just means that my love for God moves me to entrust my eternal soul to him in my life. I just entrust him with it. It's uh, all the time. It's the idea that every fiber of my being, I'm trusting in my God. I have entrusted my all to him. Can I just just be honest with you, teenager? Hey, young man, young lady. I'll be 100% honest and transparent with you tonight. If God is a sham, my life is lost. If God is not real, then then I have wasted, I have no hope. But I am so thankful that God is real. And his word is true. And I can trust him with everything in my all. And you want to love God with all your, you want things to work together for your good. You want it to be well with thee and increase mightily. Your days to be prolonged in the land Israel. Hey, love the Lord thy God with all thy soul. Trust him, give him your life, your soul. Trust him with your all. If he can be trusted with this much, he can be trusted with this much. Give him your life, your soul. Trust him. Number three, this love is described as this. Love the Lord thy God with all thy might. It really just means that my love for God moves me to spend all my strength and energy in both obeying and serving him. You know, the fact is this. Young person, you may not think it now. I remember the days of old when I was young. Teenager and college age, and man, I could go play ball for two or three hours, come in, get a drink of water. I could go back out and play more ball. Now I can sit on my couch and think about it. That's about it. I can go out for 10 minutes, come back in, drink of water, heating pad, ibuprofen. I mean, it, it, no, there is limited energy strength in this body. It doesn't go on forever. Can I tell you right now, if you live to 60, 70, 80, 90, Your resources are limited. What will you spend them on? Strength and energy and time and and talents that God has given you. But they are not unlimited. They are not endless. So if I love him with all my might, it moves me to spend all my strength and energy in obeying his word and serving him. This limited time here on earth. During it, my love, my love for God consumes and constrains me. I will gladly spend and be spent, as Paul put it, not on my own pursuits, not in living my life. As the world says, this life should be lived, but in obedience to his will and way. As my Savior, my King, my Lord, I will gladly use up all my limited resources in pursuit of pleasing my God. That is what it means to love him with all of our might. Man, I'm telling you, when we read that, it ought to convict us, it ought to move us, it ought to stab our hearts and say, whoa, do I really love God like that? With all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my might. Is that the description of my love for him? Now, mom and dad, that's for us. <laughs> He's telling you and I, this is how you and I should live before our children, the example we set before them. And let me say this, it's a whole lot more than just providing your children a quote-unquote Christian home. It's a whole lot more than just taking them to Sunday school and patch and other things. It's a whole lot more than just putting them in a Christian school, helping them to be faithful to youth group. Uh, It breaks my heart. 20-something years in the ministry, I have talked to my fair share of broken-hearted parents 
of wayward children who lament to me how their children grew up in church. They went to Christian school. They were faithful to youth group. But they do not love the Lord. The greatest impetus, the greater responsibility, the greatest falls on that child. And it isn't always the case when there's a wayward child. But I'll tell, I'll tell you, it takes more than those things for someone, a young person, to grow up and love the Lord. With all their heart, with all their soul, and all their might. You see what God is telling this generation of Israelites, a generation of believers for even today, that uh, that kind of parent... Being that kind of parent that puts that example before them, uh, it starts with loving the Lord. Demonstrating that in, in our own lives, being an example of this through living it out, teaching it much, saturating our families with the Word of God and the ways of God. That's how I pass it on. That's how I instill it. Notice how he puts it in the passage, how God does. Look at verse number 6. And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be where first in thine heart. Mom and dad, they've got to be in you. you. You've got to embrace them. You've got to be consumed with them. Verse 7, and thou shalt teach them diligently. If I know anything about the word diligently, it means consistently and uh, uh, sticking at it. Keep on keeping on. Do it diligently. Don't give up. Don't get tired at it. Do it diligently unto thy children. And shall talk of them when thou sittest in thy house. Listen to me. Hey, maybe you're a parent tonight. You say, well, you know what? I, I don't talk to my kids much. I, I don't talk to them about spiritual things. I just live it before them. Good for you, but you're a half failure. Pastor Henry, you're being a little harsh tonight. No, I, I'm just telling you what the scriptures say. You know what the scriptures say? Talk of them. Talk of them. Because your children not only need to see godly living through their eye gate, they need it through their ear gate. They need to hear about it. They need to know the words of the commands of God. You need to help them to take it in and saturate them with That's what God's word says. When do you do it? Well, thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. It's funny, it didn't say when thou sittest in thy house, play on thy electronics, watch thy television, do thy hobbies. Hmm. I mean, that's good to do. I don't mind hobbies. I don't mind doing that. But I'll tell you, you know what your number one priority? is not self-entertainment. It's teaching your children. Teaching our children. Can I tell you, I don't want one child of Fostoria Baptist Church to grow up and not love the Lord. And how do we do that? We follow God's word. So I'm encouraging you tonight. Hey, don't, don't sit by and do nothing. Be the parent that God has called you to be. One who loves the Lord and then teaches and speaks of it. Notice it. When thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon thy post of thy house and on thy gates. I love that. We've talked about this passage before, and I, I like the scriptures on the walls that has become more prevalent or uh, fashionable, and uh, I like it. I, I do. I love seeing scripture all over the place and in framings and art. And, ah, it's tremendous. Praise the Lord. Keep doing it. Teach. Talk about that. Man, the Lord is good. And you speak of it, and you teach and impart that to the next generation. See, verses 6 through 9 is an expression of our love for God displayed before our children and our family. Now, young people, listen. Verses 6 through 9 speak of the responsibility of both the parents and the children. The parents are supposed to do these things, teach God's word, have a heart, the love in their heart, the commandments in their own heart, so forth and so on. But children, listen to me. The Bible now says on you, you need to follow them. You need to listen to them. Your responsibility is to learn and listen and, and live the same as mom and dad. Now, children, hey, teenagers, little ones, I sure am glad that God has given you moms and dads as guides and examples. It's for your benefit. You say, why? why? How does this benefit me? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look at verse number 12, shall we? Verse number 12 first. We'll look at several verses. Then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. All right, years have come and gone. Years have passed. When you get in the land and you kind of have grown up, I don't want you to forget the Lord. These things will help you not to forget the Lord. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is older, he will not. Come on, hey, listen, this is scriptural. This, God said, look, do this. And boy, they found out, boy, if we don't do that, it, it, it wreaks havoc. Notice it. 
Then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. Jump down to verse 17. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God. In his testimonies, in his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord. That it may be well with thee. And that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord swear upon or unto thy fathers look down at verse 24 and the lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the lord our god huh for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is at this that day at this day, excuse me, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God that he hath commanded us. Now listen to me. I love verse 24, that statement I emphasize, for our good always. You know what that sounds like to me? Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God and who are the called according to his purpose. Boy, God's saying the same thing here back in Deuteronomy. Hey, you do this. You keep my commandments. You listen. You obey. You love me with all your heart, soul, and might. And my friend, it'll be always for your good. Verse 25, I like this statement here. It says, it shall be our righteousness. And you know what that is? That's hearing, well done, thou good or righteous and faithful servant. Literally, the idea here is not only for our good, but you know what we, our goal as a servant is? To bring glory to God. When he says in verse 25, it shall be our righteousness, that's literally saying, man, as a servant, I brought him glory. There ought to be nothing that moves us more than the fact that I want to please my God. I, I, I want to bring him pleasure. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and bring him glory in doing so. And yet in this passage, there's a great warning. Look at verses 14 and 15. And young people, this is really what I want to talk to you about tonight. Ye shall not go after other gods... Of the gods of the people which are round about you. Verse 15. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee. And destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Now this is strong language. But it's understandable because what does he say? Your God is a jealous God. A jealous God. Now. He says, I know there's going to be false gods there. There's going to be people who follow false gods around you that will work to get you not to follow God, but rather forget him, okay? I've said it before from this pulpit, young people, teenager. The devil and the world around you, they want you to make God of money, wealth, fame, living the, the American dream, life as whatever you would define, your hobbies, your entertainment, even other people, make small gods of them. That's what the devil wants. That's what the world encourages because the devil is the god of this world, little g. And so the fact is this, hey, there's going to be people all around you, like he says to these folks, there's going to be people all around you that are going to try to get you to forget God. Young person, I want to tell you right now, there, there is a world out there and a devil out there that wants you to make God of heaven a hobby. That wants you to make the God of heaven, yeah, I, yeah, I grew up in Sunday school, youth group, but that, that was just when I was a kid, and uh, that's not that. He, they want you to forget God, and you say, well, I'll never forget God. Understand what he means by forget God. It isn't that I lose knowledge of God. No, no, no. Forgetting God here is... You allow your love to grow cold. In Revelation, you, you've left your first love. When you realize that Jesus Christ died for you when you could do nothing to gain heaven, when he made a way for you to gain heaven and lose hell, boy, that love started to grow. But through influences and allowing the people around you to influence you, your heart has grown cold. Your love has waned for your God. You see... The challenge for you and I is to ensure that we do not forget the Lord. And we have to listen to God. So listen, there's going to be people. You live in Fostoria, Michigan? Oh, good. That's, that's protected from the world. I go to such and such school, and, and boy, I, I don't have to worry about bad influences. The pastor, it's a Christian school. Sinful nature's everywhere. 
There's people who don't love the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might. You know I'm for Christian schools, but I'll tell you right now, I'm more so for people who love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Those are the people I want to follow. Those are the people that I want around me and they say, hey, let's do it this way. Let's go to life this way. Let's follow after God. But I also understand wherever I go on this earth, wherever I'll be, there will always be people around me who want me to worship another God. And they may be Christians, but they have started worshiping the world. They've started worshiping the mighty dollar. They have themselves, their pride, their, their own desires, and the selfish nature as their God. And they're going to influence me. They're going to try to get me to do the same thing. You see, when we forget the Lord, we no longer have our love for Him that it consumes our heart, consumes our soul, and all of our mind. Can I tell you right now, young person, look at me in the eyeballs, would you? Teenager, would you look up this way? Our God in heaven knows every teenager around you. Every young person around you. And he knows whether they have a heart to follow after God. If they love God with all their soul, heart, and might. So keep your eyes and ears on the examples that God has given you. I love that statement. Our God is a jealous God. One of my joys as a youth pastor was always to watch... Uh, and young people, junior high, even into high school, when, you know, hormones started going and a guy thought this girl in the youth group was his everything. And then, unfortunately, often contrary to counsel and even sometimes contrary to parents, that girl became everything to that guy. And he invested himself emotionally and everything. I mean, he just, this was it. He made that person, that girl, his life. And you know what I would notice? I, I, could, I could write a book on it, as your parents could too. You know what would happen? I could tell when there was a point he became too emotionally invested. He did not guard his heart to the time that God said, okay, it's time to give your heart away. He didn't do that. He became emotionally invested at a time that was well ahead of God's plan. You know what happened? I saw in this young man a change, and many young men, unfortunately, all the time. You know what happens to that? They'll be in a youth group, and there'll be this girl, and all they can think about is that girl. The only thing they can watch is that girl. Another boy comes in there, radar. Oh, don't you dare talk to her. Don't you, giving you the eye. Get away from her. That's my girl. Come on. I'm not stupid. I'm a guy. I've seen him. I'm a youth pastor. I've seen him as a teenager. You, I'm telling you, get away from her. And then, guess what? The boy comes talk to my girl. My girl. She says, how dare she? Hi. Oh, how could she tell him hi? Walks away. What are you talking to him for? Huh? What are you talking to him? Don't look at me like I'm weird. This happens in Christian high schools and Christian youth groups. This happens all over the place. Now listen to me. Why? Because it became too emotional. That's jealousy. You're mine. You belong to me. You, you don't talk to anybody else. You don't do anything with anybody else. How dare you sit in the close to them? How and I look and I say, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's a big difference than if some guy comes up to Erica Henry, puts his arm around her, and draws her close. Then you're going to see a jealous pastor. And I'll tell you why. The power of the ring. She's mine. Back off. I've reached the point where I can emotionally invest in that relationship. Listen to me. Young person, that's why I don't encourage dating in high school. Mom and Dad, you've got to determine. I get it. I, I'm just telling you as a pastor, someone who's watched life, seen people, as a pastor, study God's Word, I'm telling you, seen every generation come up. Why worry about it till college? Don't get emotion invested. I know the days have come, but I think they're gone with sweet, uh, high school sweethearts. Listen, if you meet somebody in high school and you think they're the one, praise the Lord. Let it happen in God's timing. He'll bring him back around. Can I tell you a true story? This is not in my notes. I'll just tell you. <laughs> I may get in trouble. Uh, uh, when I was in college, okay, my wife and I, not at the time, okay, she was just graduating high school, and we had a time and opportunity to go to something together. And we went to it. I enjoyed myself completely and totally. I went back home uh, a year or two in college, and I looked at my mom and dad that night, very late. They could attest. They may be watching very live stream. I came home and I said this. 
Mom, Dad, that's the kind of girl I want to marry. Somebody like that. That's what I want. That's what I believe the Lord. I don't know if she's the one. I don't know. Four years later, all these people in my life, hey, do you know that Erica Marcello? She's back home from college. You know what they said to her? Hey, there's this really desperate guy. No. (laughs) There's this guy who's who's done with college. He's teaching at Christian school. He hasn't found anybody. Four years. I'm telling you, my friends, if it's God's will, do it God's way. You'll get God's reward. What's God's reward? His best. Just do it. Trust him. Now listen, I have the right to be jealous of my wife right now. A high school boy has the right to be jealous. Listen, if <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I'm gearing up. My daughter's a junior. That's her rig. I'm gearing up to deal with boys. I am kind of looking forward to it. Anyway, I take some advice from Dave Cooper, who's dealt with it many, many times over. But anyway, <laughs> that's terrible. Uh, I am looking forward to it. I really am in some ways. But I'm telling you right now, if some girl comes and tries to tell Reagan, long before I've given him okay, long before I said, as her father, because listen, my responsibility as a father is that daughter has been given to me and trusted to me by my God. And it's my job to make sure she loves God with all her heart, her soul, and might. And when she has established a pattern in her life to do so, then we can start talking about the next step in her life. But until then, if some guy comes along and he thinks he owns Reagan Henry, he's got another thing coming. But the moment when she's 30, 35, 40, I walk her down the aisle. (laughs) 45. Uh, The moment I walk her down the aisle and I say, who gives this this, this lady to be married to this man? And I tearfully say, her mother and I. Can I tell you right then? When he says, I do, she says, I do, he has every right to be jealous. Now listen to me. God created you. God saved you. He has every right to be jealous. When he doesn't have your heart, when you don't love him with all your heart and soul and might, every believer, teenager, young person, adult, God has a right to be jealous. He has a right. You and I don't belong to ourselves. We belong to him who hath bought us with a price. My friend, young people, my heart is that you would grab hold of this truth this evening. Work in your own heart, understanding the jealousy of God. He wants the best for you, but you can only have the best of God. His greatest reward, if you love him with all your heart and soul and might. And praise be unto him. Listen, God has given you parents in your life as examples. Follow them. Mom and dad, do right. Don't let people stop you from loving and following God. Don't let your peers stop you from loving and following God. Do it by purposing not to follow your, fear, your peers, number one. Teenager, listen to me. I am thankful for our youth group. You can never know how thankful I am for Pastor Tony and Miss Diane. I am grateful that uh, we have a good-sized youth group. We have teenagers who, who seem uh, to uh, certainly know the Lord and some who love the Lord and, and want to follow him. Listen, that's fantastic. They will never replace, at this point in your life, your parents. Those are God's examples for you. Not other teenagers. And especially teenagers who don't love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and mind. My heart breaks when I see some of you, young, you teenagers, you start following the pattern, the example of yeah, maybe even college kids, maybe even fellow teenagers who don't love the Lord, your God, with all their heart, soul, and mind. And yet you have parents who do. And you ought to follow and, and heed their example. See, too often, p- young people will replace their parents with peers in one sphere of influence when it comes to whom they choose to follow. It's not good. It's not right. It's not what God wants. My heart is burdened for our young people to follow God. And to do that, you need to follow the right examples and guides. God's word, God's Holy Spirit, and godly parents. And yet, God has given us even more than that. 
Psalm chapter 37 and verse 37, here's the verse. It says, mark the perfect man and behold the upright for the end uh, of that man is peace. It goes well with this morning's message. Okay. Now, I love this verse. I always chuckle when I come to this verse. And uh, Mark Smith, Mark Quick, you'll appreciate this. In college, I had a friend whose name was Mark. He loved this verse. He'd go around quoting it, especially the young ladies. Mark, the perfect man. That's what he said. I literally, he did. I'll tell you right now, he wasn't perfect. And that's certainly not what it means. That's not the point of this verse. The point of the verse is this. That word mark means call, observe, watch, guard. It's the idea that you and I say, okay, that's a good example. That's a good pattern. Somebody who loves the Lord with all their heart, soul, and might. And the context tells us that idea of upright. It means they're righteous. It's a person who is doing right, has been obedient. They aren't, it does not mean that they are without mistakes but they deal with them in a biblical manner. They will make wrongs right. They'll confess sin. They'll walk uprightly uh, with their God. God wants you and I to mark such a person. Observe them. Take note of them. So here's the standard. They're upright. They're righteous. They love the Lord with all their heart and soul and might. That's the person, young person, teenager, that you want to say, yeah, I'm going to be like that. Not the te fellow teenager that you think is cool and popular uh, and they don't love the Lord. Or the college student that plays video games, and, but they're a whole lot of fun, and they do this, and, but they don't love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and mind. Listen, do not mark them as an example. You mark the one who's upright, the one who's righteous, the perfect man, the mature, the, the complete man. In fact, that is exactly what, what Paul says, Philippians chapter 3 and, and verses 15 and following. Time has flown from us, but let me just say this, and I'm going to cut through the thick. I, I might come back to this in a, uh, in a future message, maybe Sunday night. I was hoping to get through all of it, but I still have three more pages. Um, <laughs> I've gone through three. That's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me say this. Okay, let me finish. I mean this, okay? Because this is one of the things that the Lord has laid on my heart. Okay, uh, on Philippians there, chapter 3, we get into it, and it talks about those. Paul says, Mark, those who have the same heart as me to love the Lord and so forth. He says, also, avoid some people, and again, we might get into this, but whose God is their belly. They do what they want to do. Uh, he goes on, and he also describes not only who God is their belly, but he also says this. He says, whose glory is their shame. The thing that they rejoice in, the thing they talk about all the time, the thing that is number one in their life is actually their shame. Because as a Christian, you know who ought to be number one in their life? God. So the thing that consumes them, and you can put entertainment, hobby, life, money, you name it, another person, they consume with that. He says, avoid that person. person whose God is their belly whose glory is their shame, and then he says, who mind earthly things. Avoid them. Mind earthly things mean they'll spend their energy, just like we talked about, they'll spend their energy, their efforts, their strength to, to get things here on earth, not to serve their God. He also says in that passage, again, he says, mark them. Those who are righteous and have a heart to follow after me. Now listen, okay? I mean this. I'm trying to bring it to a close. Land the plane sometimes. That's difficult. But listen. I want every teenager to look at me. I'm tired of hearing. Well, I don't have somebody in my youth group, in my church that I can look up to that's my age. I realize Pastor Henry and deacons and Sunday school teachers, some of us can be really old. And you lament the fact that, you know what, they're, 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 they're just, I just have nobody my age. Number one, I think that's a dead wrong attitude. Because Timothy had Paul. And we could go down the line. There are older folks you need to emulate and say, you know what, I need to mark them because they're upright and they're righteous. They love the Lord thy God with all their heart and soul. Men and women alike in this church, and I could list a ton, and I could just tell you, yeah, you need to do that. Sunday school teachers, deacons, pastor, pastor's wife, you need to do that. You need to emulate, because they love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and mind. But listen to me. What I am seeing a propensity, what I am seeing a trend amount on young people, is all you think to follow are your peers and those around your age. A generational attitude of, man, I, I just wish I could find somebody. And I, I, I'm going to pattern my life off of somebody who's my age because I just connect better. Listen to me. Hey, listen to me. Okay, you want to think that way? You know there's an old saying, sometimes we miss the forest for the trees. 
If you need someone who is young, and you want to look up to them and say, okay, I'm going to mark them because they love the Lord with all their heart, soul, and mind. I would tell you, there are very few people that you could mark to follow in such a way than Pastor Tony and Miss Diane. Than Pastor Aaron and Miss Heidi. Than Mr. Quick and Melissa. Staff people who we brought on to Fostory Baptist Church who listen to me, I have interviewed, I have looked at their life, I have talked, I have witnessed from afar a couple of them, and I'll tell you, boy, these people have demonstrated a love for God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their might. They have done things right. They've gone to mom and dad. Hey, I think I'm interested in this person. Mom said not yet. Dad said not yet. Okay. They waited for God. They did God's will, God's way to get God's reward. They have a pattern of living for him. Hey, stick around Fostoria Baptist Church and school. You'll find out. They live for the Lord. They'll gladly be spent for God. They will gladly spend themselves. And my friend, can I tell you, it ain't nothing for a basketball player to go spend his life for basketball, soccer. Listen, that is worthless. But to live and spend your life for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, mark that man and that woman. Emulate them. Use them as an example. Man, don't miss it. You have something wonderful here. Hey, listen to them. Mark them. Observe to do. Add them to your parents. And my friend, you have all the makings to turn out to be a godly young man and a godly young lady. And God has given you so much. There's some of us here who grew up in a church that didn't have a youth pastor. Didn't have two or three teenagers. Certainly only had maybe one pastor on staff. Man, you have some godly young people. Can I tell you, from my position, Pastor Aaron, Pastor Tony, they're young. Brother Ron, they're young. Hey, you have somebody you can look up to. You can use in his example. Praise the Lord. Now listen to me. I wouldn't say it if I didn't know they love the Lord with all their heart and soul and might. Be thankful. And then young person, can I tell you, be thankful for your parents. The example that God has given. Now, parents, I'll tell you, I love what Paul said. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's the, that's the challenge for us. That's not a proud statement. That's a, uh, from a heart, a, 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 a heart that says, man, I realize the responsibility when I say that. I've got to make sure that I love him with all my heart and soul and mind. So for us as adults and parents, we've got to make sure that's our heart. Then young people, can I tell you, listen to me. Don't follow peers. Don't follow people in your life that don't love the Lord. Mark them who love the Lord, who are serving Him, who have a pattern over many years of putting God first and, and uh, man, living for Him. My friend, you will not go wrong. Mark them. Follow them as they follow Christ.